see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another week of Flames hockey and another week of Flames losses. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to recap this week. And Matt, we won't talk about our thoughts on what this week means for us yet. Let's just get through what happened. Flames yeah. was supposed to play three games, ended up playing two games. Maybe that's a blessing in disguise. Um, March 29th, the Flames played against the Winnipeg Jets and didn't do too well. Jets ended up winning 5-1 in this game. Yeah, um, not a good performance. I thought the Flames played really well in the first period in this one. Yeah, um, it, it wasn't in, really until that uh, kicked in goal that I think then the whole team just collapsed in on itself. And, like, honestly, I have no idea what the referee was seeing there because that was as blatant of a kicking motion as I've ever seen in the NHL or at any level and like that's a usually a one second oh yeah he really did kick that and no goal but it is eric furlat and well yeah <laughs> you, you know what they say refs are blind yeah and some are just really not very good <laughs> I, i'm surprised though after all the stuff we've seen recently with sort of refs coming under scrutiny that furlat is still sort of unsupervised yeah, frankly, if one of them in the NHL, sort of like Angel Hernandez in baseball, like if there was one umpire or a referee to get fired, you would expect it to be those two. But yeah, just really, really not good at their job. Um, some something I noticed in this one is Goudreau was setting Monahan up for a lot of really good opportunities, and Monahan didn't capitalize on them, and it makes me wonder. If he's playing through an injury, like he just didn't yeah. look like he could capitalize the way he usually would. Well, Monahan's basically been a thirty-plus goal scorer every year of his career, basically, other than his rookie year. And to go from that to, I think, what five goals? Like he should be getting Sounds about about, tw right. about twenty this season, so he should be at about like fourteen or fifteen right now. And, like, it's just quite apparent that something is off with him entirely. His shots don't seem to have anything on them, and it's... It, yeah. Didn't he have a wrist surgery two seasons ago? Yeah, I think he's had three or four wrist injuries, and I think that that's what's causing the issue again. Well, and that makes me start to wonder. I mean, if we're starting to talk about, you know, who should stay and who should go and who do we build around, if you've got a guy whose wrists aren't holding up, it makes me wonder if you can really build around Monahan as a key piece. Well, that's exactly one of the things I was wanting to discuss afterwards uh, is that um, the status of the team and, like, just general building perspectives after what this is because <laughs> that's a, exactly one of the points i was actually going to bring up all right well let's come back to that i think the best way to sum up this winnipeg game and tell me if you disagree winnipeg's winnipeg's best guys were good calgary's best guys were not yeah and even the lesser guys on the flames didn't seem to have any jump to them either and uh, frankly, the goaltending was adequate and should have been... It, they could have been better, but still... Calgary's best guys started well, and then, as always, they faced some adversity. I'd say it was after that first Shifley goal, the second goal, that the Flames just fell apart. Yep, and just the overall lack of intensity. The give-a-crap meter was at zero, and that's what happened. Yeah, well, like and like this is was literally a do or die game, and you get blown out five one, and basically after the first ten minutes look terrible, um, and there was no pushback, no resistance. Here's easy two points, Winnipeg, have fun. But it was pretty. I mean, if we if we think about that, it, it was a typical Calgary Flames game. Oh, for sure. Like, there was nothing surprising about either of the games this week. Well, the, there should have been three games. That was the game on the 29th on uh, Monday. Then the game on Wednesday at Vancouver, the Flames were supposed to play the Canucks, and that game got postponed due to what at the time I think was one or two uh, Canucks players having COVID. 
we now know that there's 20 guys in that team and three coaches who've all um, been put on the COVID protocol list. So that game got canceled. So the Flames got the night off, and then they came back here on the 2nd of April to play um, versus the provincial rivals. This was uh, in Edmonton, so at Edmonton. I'm going to say back here, I mean back in Alberta, but uh, back in Alberta to play against Edmonton in Edmonton and again ended up losing 3-2 to two in this one. Michael Stone got his first goal of the season. I think his first goal in almost a year, if I remember correctly. But, um, yeah, this, again, not a, not a great effort. Yeah, the Flames, they got up, stopped playing, Edmonton tied it. Got up again, stopped playing, Edmonton tied it. Edmonton won. Yay. I thought that I thought the teams were pretty evenly matched, even though Calgary didn't put in a great effort. Yeah. Well, how would you say it's kind of Edmonton is really a paper tiger. They have two good guys and some adequate players. Well, like, how many Edmonton games this season have we said we got beat by McDavid? Yeah. Well, that's exactly it. Like one guy. You know, like if you're not containing them. And you're not getting any actual assistance from any of your own players. Like, you can pretty much expect McDavid to get one or two points every time you play him. Just because that's basically his point per game average. And it, it, you're needing somebody on your team to actually show up and play hockey. And thus far this season, the Flames just haven't really been interested in doing that. So... Yeah, you know, uh, the results kind of speak for themselves. Yeah, they really have. And I think it's, you know, we've we've talked a lot about Edmonton being a one-trick pony and having one guy. And I think that this whole, you know, McDavid beating the Flames thing really shows how well that one guy is positioned. And, you know, they do have Nuge, Nuge and Hopkins, R&H, and, and they've got a couple guys there. But, I mean, it's really and, – and a friend of mine said this to me after this game. He said, it's gone from the city of champions to the city of champion. Yeah, pretty much. It's like, McDavid it, – it's it's almost like a bad law firm. It's McDavid, Nuge, and Hopkins and company. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, honestly, if you put McDavid on an average team, it, it wouldn't even – like, say, Nashville – Honestly, they'd be the favorite for the cup. It's like Edmonton, like if you take McDavid out of the situation, is basically the Buffalo Sabres. <laughs> and like they they have some NHL players and that's about it. Like they're you know, Dry Saddle's good but there's just not a huge amount of depth there and McDavid's just that good, and, like, he legitimately is the best player probably since Gretzky Lemieux. And I, li I like to play a game when I watch Edmonton of see how many names I actually recognize. Yeah, pretty much. Like, there, there's about seven or eight guys that are... Uh, would pl be able to play on any NHL team. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> it slides down from there. I think the biggest issue for Calgary in this one was the goaltending. Like, Markstrom's great beginning of the season seems to have ended right after he came back from his injury. And I think this is now five straight losses for Markstrom after this one. So, I don't know what's wrong there. Again, do we have a goalie who's also playing through an injury? But um, I think we got to figure out what's wrong with Markstrom. And if he needs to sit, let's get Riddick some more starts. Yeah. At this point, though... You know, like, but why, where, why, where risk a, why risk a long term injury? Yeah, well, the Flames are a week away from the trade deadline, and like, you know, being perfectly honest, I think like this is the last week of Riddick as a Flame, just due to where the Flames are in the standings and like everything around the team. So, so Louis like, Domingue, I, I, come know, on like, down. Well, it's one of those things you don't really want to have uh, Riddick get hurt either no and, you know and it, that's where we're at right now like marks from yeah he's struggling and we should put the backup in but hey we might be able to get a good draft pick out of that guy we don't want him getting hurt he needs all the bubble wrap around him right now <laughs> that's why we signed louis Domingue, matt yeah louis Domingue so, is the answer no one ever yeah. said that in hockey before yep yeah. well when we look at this season with the two games played calgary's now played 38 games which means they have 18 left. They're 16, 9, and 3 at 35 points, tied with Vancouver, but we're 6th in the Scotia North Division. Montreal's at 41. 
And while it's possible to be in the playoffs, I mean, you'd pretty much have to be rubbing your tummy and patting your head while standing on one foot in a full moon on the third Thursday of the month. It's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah, like, frankly, like, of the 18 games, the Flames probably will need to win about 15 to 16 of them. And if you could do that, you wouldn't be where we are. Yeah, and, like, they're, the Flames have shown pretty much no signs of life since the Kachuk uh, sit-down uh, with the rest of his teammates. Like, ever since then, the whole team died, basically, and... Yeah, it's been fun. Well, and so, on that, it's interesting. After an initial promising start uh, when Daryl Sutter came in, I mean, we won, what, the first two or three games with him? Yeah, three. Um, we crashed hard in the last nine. No team has fared as badly in the standings as Calgary since March 17th, not even the Buffalo Sabres. But you know you're doing excellent when you're worse than Buffalo at any point. We want, we want people to talk about us. Hold on, hold our beer. Buffalo, we're coming for you. Yep. Actually, at that well, point, you don't even see someone to hold your beer. You can drink it because you're not playing. Yeah. Well, like, if you look at the standings right now, like, the only teams that are worse in terms of just raw points than the Calgary Flames are the Ottawa Senators, who are five points behind, the Detroit Red Wings, who are four points behind, the Los Angeles Kings, who are one point behind but have two more games to play. The Anaheim Ducks. Uh, the New Jersey Devils, who are three points back uh, with one, uh, two games in hand. And the aforementioned Buffalo Sabres. So, like, you're talking about literally one of the... Like, they're the seventh worst team in the league right now. And could easily, like, if the other teams win their games in hand, like, the Flames could be the fifth worst team in the league. Like, that's just pathetic, <laughs> frankly. And But they're right where they deserve to be based on how they're playing. Well, that's it. If you look at them on paper, they're not where they deserve to be. But if you look at what this team's put on the ice, they're exactly where they deserve to be. And I guess, Matt, I mean, we'll do a full, you know, deconstruction at the end of the season, but... In, let's say, one statement, what do you think the issue with this team has been? Uh, well, when Daryl was hired, he was here to sort out this team. And, like, if they had a it in them, that inner fire to rise above and become that elite team that their talent level shows that they could be if they actually were pulling in the same direction or to sort out well these guys don't have that fire in them and frankly uh with the results that we've seen this team does not have that inner fire at all and like it Frankly, to this point in the season, like, my Flames MVP for the forward group is Milan Lucic. Like, you, you know, like, that's not a slight on Lucic, but, like, if he's your best guy, night in, night out, consistently, you know, at his stage in his career, like, that is really bad. And... So so you've mentioned the past moving on from Gio, and I've defended Gio and said maybe we got to take the C off him. Here's something I thought of this week, speaking of Lucic, and tell me what you think. You probably know where I'm going with this, but Lucic is well-respected in the dressing room. What if you were to take the C off of uh, off of Goudreau and put it on to Lucic for a season or two? Well, that uh, frankly, that's actually what I would do. and I don't um, know that Maddie's ready for it quite yet. Yeah, and like... Basically, what I'm looking at with this team is that now that we basically have the answer of, like, exactly who this team is, like, you know, there are a bunch of players that have skill, but they don't have it in them to actually elevate their games when it matters, and so that's fine. Now, the key thing to focus on is... Which of these parts will actually be a useful component to this team three years from now? Because we're going to have to go through a retool and an extensive one because there are too many players that are just, frankly, not conducive to actually winning hockey games. 
And, like, we saw last year with this team, um, when they cycled out TJ Brody and Travis Hamnick, and, and, like, we replaced Brody internally with uh, Rasmus Anderson, and we signed Chris Tanev. Intrinsically, in terms of the cap, it stayed about the same, dollar-wise. But just cycling out those two players for those two players, the Flames had a benefit just from the differentness of it. And I think that this team just needs to basically cycle out most of the forward group, pretty much. Um, and, like, anything that... Any player that's more on the veteran side, like Giordano, start to, you know, reset and switch things up because like this group as a group will not cut it there i don't uh, i don't think they actually have it in them to be winning players so well, and and i don't think you're going to get rid of all the veterans you're not going to no. be able to but i think you need to start asking yourselves realistically who is who is a top part going forward and we talked about monahan earlier i mean if he's got a wrist injury i think he could still be a useful depth piece but i think you have to ask yourself at that point is he your one two center or yeah is exactly he, you know the number three center on the team when he's healthy and i think that they've got to start really asking that question of who is sort of the the top guy well, for long term and, and honestly if sean monahan can't shoot you have to ask your question the question what does he actually do as an NHL player? Well, that's it. And, and if it's that bad that he can't shoot, I think it's time to retire. Uh, and I think that, like, if his... And you're not going to get anything for him if he can't shoot. No. And, like, it, it's... You know, and it might be just one of those that you, him... His cap hit being freed up in two years might be the net gain that you can go spend that money elsewhere. Well, like, and, uh, if he's that, and if he's that bad, I think you'd almost want to find a way to get a doctor, put him on LTIR, and then just, you know, wait out the cap hit. Yeah, and I think that's what might end up happening at some point. As bad as that sounds, you know, like, because, like, Monaghan is not a good defensive player. His passing ability is fine, but, like, there, he's not a fast player. He doesn't hit. Like, he's frankly this season has been a liability on the ice period and not been really an nhl caliber player and that's part of the reason why the flames are where they are because you're relying on him to score and he hasn't so and i think that's the other thing too is if monahan's gonna stick around and if they can get his wrist somewhat healthy I mean, how many how many guys do we see that are old and on a bad contract and a bad contract because they're injured? I mean, it was a good contract and it was signed, but I think Monahan's getting to be that way where he's getting older and he's got a bad contract potentially, and I think you'd have to transition him into being something else. He can't be your scorer the way he is. You'd have to transition almost being your, you know, third-line, two-way center. Yeah, if you could figure, you know... At this point, like with but for him Monahan, to drop down to three, then I think that means Backlund either got to jump up to two or get shipped out or shipped out of town. Well, and that's the thing. Like if you look at the center group, you have Lindholm, Monahan, Backlund, and Derek Ryan. Frankly, in three years, the only player of that group that I see as being a viable player for this team is Elias Lindholm. So, and, and is Elias Lindholm a center next year? Well, I think you would have to just based on need more than anything. And I think a lot of it's going to depend on what you can get for Johnny. Yeah. And, like, honestly, like, to me, like, if somebody gives a good offer for Backland, even at the trade deadline, I, I would have to. Because, like, it's one of those things that, like, Backland is north of 30. And... Yep. Like, I, I love Backlund. Like, you know, he's one of my favorite players and has been for the longest time. But it's also not fair to him to have to go through another rebuild, which basically retool rebuild is what this team is going to be going through. And by the time he's 33, 34, is he going to be an effective third, fourth line guy? 
and like are you starting to get that upward like is Connor Zari at that point going to be pushing for his spot and then you're paying like five million dollars for a depth guy where like right now he's a viable five million dollar player you know and I think like the Flames do need to recoup some assets and Mm -hmm. you know I think Backlund's one of the more valuable ones well, and, and I think, you know, and, and people have asked me recently, friends and family and some people online, when do you make the trades? And I said to them, you make the trade whenever you get the value you're looking for. And whether that's at the deadline, whether that's in the off season, I think there's going to be a pretty quiet deadline myself um, just because of the, the challenges of moving players back and forth over the borders and whatnot. And especially now with Edmonton getting a COVID outbreak, I could see there being hesitancy to bring guys in and out. Yeah. But I think, yeah, if you can move him, I think Backlund has served his purpose here. But at his price, if you can find a, a buyer, you move him. Now, you were talking about Zari. I also think that by the time Zari's a viable replacement, Backlund will be on the last year of his deal, so it won't be as bad. I mean, Zari will still be, you know, com- probably coming off an ELC at that point. Yeah, exactly. And, like, that's where, like, why I specified, like, the three-year thing because like frankly like if this team is going to be going through a significant retool like you're going to have to fit like the new pieces that you get because you are going to get nhl players for some of what you trade out like say the good draw for connect me thought or you know like you're going to have to fit that player in and see how that works but, like, this team's just going to have to go through a complete evaluation player by player. And, like, is this guy going to be a long-term viable part? Like, Dylan Dubé and Andrew Majapane, yep, you're going to be here for three years. No, you don't even have to look at you. You're you're good. Anderson, Hannafin, and Valimaki, sure, same thing. Shillington, same thing. And then it's like, okay, now... Like, let's cycle through everybody else. And, like, say Giordano. Well, he's 38. He's not going to be in the the NHL in three years, I don't think. Giordano's contract's up at the end of next year, and I think that's the end for him. Yeah. He might get a one-year deal, like the uh, Chara contract with Washington, but... You know what, though? I think, and I would have agreed with you two years ago, I think with the cap the way it is, teams are going to want to bring up young guys who can play ELC as opposed to signing a 39-year-old to, like, a $1 million deal. I think that just because of some of the cap limitations we're seeing, I mm-hmm. think it'll be done when this is over. I could see that. I think you want to start getting your guys into your system early and filling those number seven roles with maybe your your tweener guys. Yeah, and so, like, with all of these things, like, it just starts to make sense to start, you know, like, evaluating hard that, like, you know, like, a guy like Gaudreau, frankly, to me, he's gone uh, by the draft. Like, I don't see him next year at all. No, and I think a lot of who's going to stay and who's going to play where is really, to me, hinging on what we get for Gaudreau. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we get a center for Gaudreau, then I think that Lindholm moves to right wing. If we get a winger for Gaudreau, then Lindholm moves to center. And I think the pieces you have to backfill all depend on that one pivot of where Lindholm is. So I think really the Gaudreau deal almost needs to happen. I don't want to say sooner right than, away, but yeah, sooner, sooner rather than later. Than you you got to have it done, like you said, by the draft so that you can then start to build appropriately. Yeah. And like, would I be shocked if he was gone next week? Not at all. Like, honestly, like, if there are te because there are teams that could use him, and, you know, as a viable piece, and he is a cheap contract for the pure offense he brings. Well, I was going to say, if you look at Goudreau as, you know, I mean, he is in a good season, a 90-point guy. I mean, he's got that potential, or he has in the past. Um, I think, you know, at 6.7, show me another bona fide top-line left winger who's making 6.7. Yeah, exactly. And I- and I think if Calgary were to, I mean, they know they're going to lose Ryan next year. And I'm not saying they should do this, but if they were willing to eat half that, you could probably get a King's Ransom for him. Oh, yeah. You know, if, yeah. You, chew up, if you chew up half that and, you, and someone gets Goudreau for 3-5, I mean, we're paying, 
more for Ryan than you'd be paying for Goudreau at that point. Yeah, exactly. And like you, if you did that, like you're talking multiple firsts and multiple good prospects. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know about that yet. I don't think we're gonna see it, that kind it, of return. It depends. Mid-season. It depends. Like if you're talking like an elite team, like a top ten or bottom and, ten pick. And I don't like, think they trade him for prospects and picks. I think the Goudreau deal yeah. is a deal that's done for a top end roster player. And there's other guys you try to move for picks and prospects if you want them. But I think the Goudreau deal has to be for a top end roster player. Yeah. You know, can, you're, it, you mentioned Konechny. I mean, a deal like that where we're shipping out our top guy and we're bringing in somebody else's top guy. And because of that, I don't think it happens with a top team. I think it happens with another middling team like us or a team like Buffalo who has assets to move if they think they could be better next year. If they think, hey, maybe we're going to lose Hall, but we want to make a crack at this, um, yeah. you know, let's bring him in. So I think you might see one of those teams that's out saying, okay, let's take the opportunity to bring Goudreau in. And then let's build around him in the off season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I just if if all they get for Goudreau, and I'm not saying it's not a good package, but if what they get is a couple firsts and a, maybe a prospect or two, I think you've missed the boat on what you need to do. Yeah, well, uh, if it was Frank- a rebuild, yes. But if it's a retool and they still think they can be competitive, then you've got to move them for roster players. Yeah, well, or roster and, player. and that that philosophy also depends because. You know, like, uh, just uh, pointing out that, like, the next three years where, like, if the Flames were to go down the we suck avenue, the next three drafts are pretty good. And, like, there are some elite guys that, you know, like, if the they're gonna suck, like, it's a good time to do that. But I think you've got enough of the right parts of this core locked up. Now is not the time to go down that road. Well, that also depends on. I mean, if we look at contracts, who have we got next year under contract? We the contracts that are coming up at the end of twenty twenty one twenty two is uh, Goudreau, or is Johnny Goudreau, um, Andrew Mangiapane, Mark Giordano. So really, everybody else is in for at least two more years. So I think you, yeah. if you're going to do this, you've got the the good core of this team to keep going with. Well, and that's that's the problem, though, is that where is the goals going to come from? Like, the, like frankly, this team, like, Matthew Kachuk has disappeared uh, mm-hmm. after that, and to the point where I, like, I don't even know about his long-term viability as a flame. But Matthew Kachuk has not looked good for one season. I don't think we can write no, him I off know, yet. No, me, I know. But wait for like, him to bounce it, back next year. It's one of those where, like, he himself might want a trade because of what happened so that's why i'm kind of yeah i don't know leery, it's a new coach, leery new on hope. that i can't yeah. see that yeah um then you have lindholm who while well, he's decent he's a decent like second line player like he's not a first line mm-hmm. guy like a true like star guy by himself mm-hmm. and then you've got nothing like you have Dubé and Majapani are second, third line tweeners at this point. They might elevate themselves a bit more than that, but like I don't see either one of them having that extra gear to be a top line player. We've and, also seen that Calgary can put itself into a good position of the draft late, which is another reason I wouldn't want to go out and get a bunch of high picks. Yeah, well, like that's it. It's kind of a tough spot because like you realistically need to draft these high-end skill players in order to Mm -hmm. get goal scores and like at this point i don't really see where that's going to come like you know pelty might be good you're high on you're high on pelty you're high on zari you're not generally gonna have more than two guys a year graduate to the nhl so let's just say next year pelty and zari move to the nhl you get a first every year. Every team gets a first. To me, keep your first and just draft well and keep that system stocked. Yeah. Well, honestly, um, like I, I, Peltier might make the NHL right off the hop, but I think he might be better served by a year in the A, and I think Zari's a junior player again um, next year. But, but even if still, they're not there next year, give him another year and bring him in once you've figured out who's going where. 
Yeah, like that. That's part of the problem. Like you look at uh, the Stockton guys. Like uh, Pedersen and Phillips are probably the two best offensively skilled guys. And you try them out at the NHL level, of course, because you know, um, and see what they have. And like guys like Ruzitska and Pospisil next year when he's healthy. Well, and there's going to be a lot of turnover. I mean, I can't see Nordstrom coming back. I can't see no. Levo coming back. I can't no. see um, who else. Um, you know, those two guys. I can't see Simone coming back. Like I think those are three spots that if we are doing a retool, you do fill internally with some young guys, but I just, to me, I'm not sold that it's time to go out and move for a King's Ransom of first. Like, yes, they're good drafts, but I think you've always got to balance oh, no. like, I, now I'm not, and the I'm, future. I wasn't really meaning like going and getting a King's Ransom of first. It's more like if the Flames are going to be bad, period, mm-hmm. like their first will be a good one and, you know, they'll get a good player with that pick. Not you know what though? So I mean, much. as bad as the Flames have been over the years, they've never been bad. Like, I mean, what's the highest we've ever drafted? Fourth? Yeah. So, I mean, even if they're going to be quote-unquote bad, I and I maybe I'm uh, too optimistic, I don't think this team goes from Calgary Flames to, you know, Edmonton Oilers of the mid-2000s. I think this is going to be a team that will be just outside the playoff bubble unless well, they can push themselves in for the next couple of years. Well, the thing is, is that, like, if Monaghan, his wrist does not improve, Mm -hmm. and, like, he's basically, like, a 10 to 15 goal guy the rest of his career, like, frankly, where do the goals come from? Like, that's the the problem I have, and, like, this team actually is fairly good defensively. Which is the the strange and surprising thing. Like, they're very good at limiting the chances. It's just that they don't have any way to push back. And, like, that's where, like, the Flames might just fall to the bottom of the standings because they can't score. And... They might. You know, and... Because, like, realistically, like, could you see, like, Dubé or Manjapani getting 25, 30 goals next year? I don't. Like, well, I I can depend on who they're paired with, and again, I need to see how this all shakes out. If yeah, I don't think you pay Monahan six million to be a ten, uh, you know, ten goal guy or a ten point guy. I think if he's at that level, he's LTIR, and we use his salary for something else. Yeah, but I mean, even then, let's say that let's just assume let's use your trade. So let's say we do Goudreau for Konechny. So the first line now becomes um, Kachuk, Lindholm, Konechny. Your second line, then, if if Monahan's out, I think you've got to go shopping for a, a second line center. And when I look at second line centers that might be available, older guys, but guys that you might be able to fill in for a year or two, let's say a Michael Granlund, or um, you know a I'm just looking at guys kind of in their 30s here, a Nick Benino, or even a Tyler Bozak, someone you might be able to get cheap because they're older for a one year fill in. So if you've got a Bozak with say Mangiapani and Dubé, I think you've got a somewhat viable second line. Even if you could put another guy in there, another right winger that we go out and get. Like I think I don't think they're going to be Stanley Cup contenders next year, but I think you can put together a viable team that would help to develop those young players. And I don't think you've heard me say this about Edmonton in the past, the blind leading the blind. You can't just put a bunch of young guys out there and say, "Great, go out and try to figure it out." No. You've got you know, and it, I mean, even if let's say that we move Sam Bennett up to the second line, so you've got Bennett, you know, Bozak and somebody like I think there's enough pieces here that we can we can scatter the guys that we need to bring in around the lineup and still be somewhat competitive. Yeah, I, I still like even in that like ideal case scenario mm-hmm. there, like to me like in a 15 seed conference that to me screams like a 12 to 14 seed but let's let's be honest did you expect a guy as small as Goudreau draft in the fourth round to be a 80 plus point guy I mean sometimes points come from places we don't expect them to come from true and I think you've got to put guys into positions oh to, true to do that 
for when sure. When I look at the roster now, I don't know where those points come from, but I think Andrew Mongepani, given the right line mates, I think Matthew Kachuk, if he has a good season, could fill some of those. Like I think we need to give guys the opportunities. And I'm not saying that they're going to be a playoff team next year, but I think you need to put guys in the right opportunities with the right line mates to see who can do what. Yeah. Um, I mean, if we could drop his price, I'm not willing to pay, you know, $6 million, but if we can get Brandon Dubinsky for one year at three or four, there's another good fill-in centerman for a year. He's 35. David, you know, David Backus is 37. Bring him in for a year to fill a spot until you can find someone better. Yeah. Oh, I know. There, there are options. It's just... And, like, and I think I, I if just, we are in a if we are in a retool mode, I think it gives you a lot more flexibility there. Normally, I wouldn't say let's hire a thirty five or thirty seven year old guy, but if the whole point now is give the young guys more ice time, I think you need those thirty five, thirty seven oh, sure, yeah. year old guys to fill the roster and give them some veteran presence. For sure, and like if you're gonna do that, like you know where you're basically emphasizing the Kachucks, mm. the Dubes, the Mangiapanes the Pedersons, you know, as they come up. But, I mean, the, you asked where the scoring comes from. To me, the scoring should be coming from Johnny, so it's going to come from whoever we trade him for. If you bring in a Konechny, you're going to get scoring from Konechny. Yeah. I, I just, um, you know, like, the for, I'm just really insanely disappointed by the forward group as a whole. For and, sure. You know, like, the, the thing is, is that, one of the things I was concerned about when this, when the Flames actually uh, built things, um, when Gaudreau and Monaghan and all that came up, uh, was that uh, the forwards uh, came first, then the defensemen came up. At, you know, like Anderson and Hannafin and that. Like, they came in after, and... You know, to be like fair, usual, so they were promoted after. They were no, drafted after. No, I know. Uh, but, like, the thing is, is that um, usually with uh, successful rebuilds and development curves, the defense come first. Like, even if you mm-hmm. look at Chicago, like, Keith Seabrook and, like, guys like Cam Barker, who was a viable part of that te- You know, he didn't pan out, pan out, but he was still a good part of that team in a depth role. Um, like, those guys came before Taze and Kane. Like, they were already in the NHL before those guys came in. And, like, I, one of the concerns I had when Gaudreau and Monaghan, et cetera, came in was, like, okay, you have all the forwards, mm-hmm. but now you have a bunch of really inexperienced D, and, like, things didn't quite mesh up properly. And yeah. You know, so, like, now with, like, Hannafin and that, uh, like, they're 24, that's more, like, roughly, like, if you're going to retool and have, like, a new forward group to build around, like, actually, that's kind of more the right mix, where you're you're having a bunch of more veteran-ish defensemen and, and, like, a good solid goaltender in Markstrom as like your base and you can start adding because like how would you say like forward uh forward uh development curves are pretty quick like you saw Gaudreau go from college to NHL superstar in like two seconds Monaghan first season he scored 20 some odd goals and then has been a 30 goal guy ever since Kachuk instantly first line level player you know, like, there's not, like, for the actual, like, high-end guys, like, there's not really a huge developmental curve of, like, oh, it takes, you know, a long time in the NHL to turn into an elite guy. And, you know, it's one of those things, like, if the Flames, say, do pick in the top eight, like, there are a good couple of forwards. If you're, like, in a year or two plugging that guy into the lineup... You know, you're, you should be seeing, you know, more of, like, a Monaghan type or whatever. Like, a good, like, first, second line-ish caliber forward. And, like, if the this retool happens for, like, a year or two more, you're going to add another good forward or two. So by the time those guys get in, 
like then you're gonna have like the defense will be like fully developed in their prime with the good high end forwards. So like you know, even if like things go disastrously wrong it won't actually be a bad thing in the long term. It's just, it might suck for a bit. <laughs> well, let's talk, so let's talk about this retool term and, and maybe we're on different pages with it. I'm looking at a retool as something that gets done. You're maybe bad for a year or two and then you're competitive again. It sounds like you're looking at this as a three, four year journey, essentially. So do you think that the right thing to do right now is try to keep Let's talk about the forwards because we both agree that's where the issue is. Do you think the right thing is to try and say move Goudreau for prospects and picks and go into more of a rebuild, or do you move those guys for roster players and try to by committee get the scoring up and still be competitive? I think that, uh, like, if you look at, um, like, it's hard, like. It, it, you're it the GM. Depend. Which way are you going? When when you're uh, when someone calls you about Goudreau, what do you tell me? Want I would be going draft pick prospect, mainly because the Flames scouting department has been really nailing it consistently with their actual like depth draft picks, and like any time that they're drafting in the top three rounds, basically they're getting a pretty damn good prospect out of the deal. And so, like, to me, like, I have 100% faith in our scouting system. Whereas, like, if you've got, like, a guy like a Konechny, like, he's already been through his developmental curve, and he's kind of, like, already that 40-60 to 60 point guy. Like, I don't see him having that upper-end potential. He could, but, you know, I like, I, I think that... Um, like, how you were saying, like, with plugging in some veteran guys, like, I would still do that, it, and, you know... But you I just, guess your big your dra big trade piece is Johnny. Is Johnny going for futures, or is Johnny going for... Futures. Currents? Futures. Okay. I, you so, know, and I would... The same with uh, Giordano and Monaghan. Because the Flames have uh, spent a lot of draft capital lately uh, over the last handful of years on uh, various parts that they've needed, um, that recouping a bunch of that, like, because uh, if you look at, like, the AHL system right now, like, Ruzitska might be a good third-line player, maybe. Pedersen... Could be a sec in the same group as Dubé and Mangiapane. Phillips, I don't know if he makes it just due to his size. After that, it, I don't really see any like high end guy. And so, for, so, from a hockey perspective, you do the futures, and you know you think that there's enough there to maybe fill backwards with. Looking at this from another angle, though, if you're the ownership team, do you say to Tree Living? We're going to have butts and seats again next year, and we need to sell some tickets, and we're not selling tickets if we have no star player. Like, how much outside of hockey pressure? We're three years away, potentially, from a new building. Yeah. Do you, well, do you need pressure to be good in the new building? Like, are there other pressures here outside of just the hockey that well, might affect the win-now mentality? Well, that's the thing. Like, uh, in that particular case, like, you still would have two star players. Like, Lindholm and Kachuk would be your guys that you would... But if you're not getting any scoring, are people going to pay to come see them? Well, I think that, like, frankly, like, the Flames would need to change how they play hockey a bit. And as bizarre as this is going to sound, play more like the Young Guns era, where it's all effort all the time, and you know, like, actually have guys who can skate and, you know, play the Daryl Sutter North-South game, which is exciting if it's done right, and you're having guys that are actually willing to throw body checks and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, crash bang and muck around, and, like, that can be exciting hockey, and the fight might actually play better 
<laughs> as strange as and it the, sounds. And this is where, you know, when you're talking about where is the scoring going to come from, to me, I think that a Daryl Sutter team, when you look at Daryl Sutter teams, he gets stuff out of guys that no one else has ever been able to get sent out of. True. And he's made guys look good that were not good. I think, and this is another reason I think you got to keep, you know, building the roster players. I know where you're going with the drafting, but I also think that if we can draft well, we should be able to do well with our seven picks every year. I think that if you work with Daryl to bring in the right guys on the ice and guys he knows he can work with, I think you get more out of this team than maybe you should for the next two years. Yeah. well, like, And I think you got to capitalize on that. Well, like, uh, what I would expect, like, say if the Flames trade Gaudreau um, at the dead- deadline, say... It would be sort of like along the lines of like the Matt Duchesne uh, type return, where you're getting a guy who, like, in the destination team, it, he's not in the NHL yet, but is kind of in the close-ish range. So, basically, like, their equivalent of a Patterson, but, you know, like a better prospect than Patterson. Um you know, who might be like a second line guy coming up and that way, you know, like that is like the immediate replacement guy that you would be then plugging in the lineup, like either that season, like the rest of this year or next year and like a first plus, you know. Yeah. Like, that's more... Like, I would not want a guy like Konechny where, like, he's already a 40-point guy. I'd rather have a guy who's not quite there yet. See, and I don't want the Pedersen either. I want a guy like... And, and I'm going to go to Chicago. I want a guy like a Dylan Strom, who's, I think, on the younger end, or even more of a, a Kubalik, who's maybe on the younger end, but isn't getting the top-line minutes. Let's, let's go with Lindholm, right? Lindholm was not a top guy in Carolina because there were guys above him, but we brought him in and we put him in that role and he excelled. And I think those are the guys you try to get, the yeah. guys that are maybe behind somebody else on a you know in their lineup who, hey, we can bring him in and give him a better opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think for years, yeah, every team's got a, a couple of them, and I think it's about finding that kind of guy, your second or third line guy right now, who you could bring in and make that star or give them more responsibility and yeah. see if they can do it. Yeah. And, like, uh, this is going to sound odd, uh, but if I was to trade Gaudreau, like, my target actually would not be a forward. <laughs> it would actually be another good young defenseman. See, I think we have enough pieces that I think you've got to move Gaudreau for the forward, and then you can try to backfill defense later on. Yeah. Well, like like if you could get, like, another guy in the Valimaki, Anderson, you know, like, who's looking like a good number but three, But again, I four. think the, the question there becomes, are you trying to win next year or not? And if you are, you can't go with a defenseman. Yeah. It, again, it... It, it it's it's very hard because of the fact that like the flames really do need a fourth guy on the blue line like i i'm not sold on shillington being able to f- become that and why well, like, i think they've got they've got four if you count I don't think I still think that Geo's not number one, but I think he can still be in the top four. And I also think you could backfill that four from free agency if you had to. Yeah, like I'm I'm not even meaning uh like I'm meaning for like the defense group of the future more so than like you know, but ha- like when you need that guy though, could we draft that guy without giving up an asset and develop him through the system? Well that's you need the, him next year. Well, I you know, like if I'm going with the three year timeline like even if you draft it, like unless you draft it first overall, because the the guy that's going first is uh, a defenseman, uh, Powers, I think. Um, so you know, then obviously that would be your guy. But uh, you know, um, otherwise, I I think that you would have to acquire that guy via trade, just because, and like, it it doesn't need to be like a top guy, like it. it uh, just a guy who could develop into a serviceable 3-4 would be And I think adequate. even if you draft that guy this year, next year, and re- I mean, you know, Anderson was not a first-round pick, right? I think no. even if you draft that guy and it takes you a year of finding a plugger, 
you could oh, yeah. buy that like development it, time. Yeah, like it, it's not like an urgent need. It's just like the flames do need to start cycling more and more and more and more. And like that's so, why like so Matt, the, we, defensemen usually take a little longer to develop. That's why I would try to emphasize getting a defense a decent defensive prospect back in any of these trades like it doesn't need to be the Gaudreau trade it just needs to be like a good defensive prospect coming back at in some capacity so I think maybe you split the difference there and you take a let's call them a sec a middle six roster player and either pick or prospect be that a first as you've mentioned be that a defensive prospect a team that I think could work there even knowing where Goudreau you know wants to be what if you were to go with the Islanders you take Josh Bailey back who's 31 but he's he's your mid-tier roster player and then you take either a pick or a prospect from them. That that could be doable. You know, I think either... I mean, Eberly and Bailey are both their right wingers. Both guys are on not bad contracts. They're not going to be your, your star of the future, but they're your piece to fill in while you're developing those guys who can still contribute. And that's yeah. not the star of the, the trade. You getting the roster player you need in either Eberly or Bailey, I take either one of them. And then the star of the, the deal becomes that pick or prospect. Yeah. And I could, yeah, something along those lines. Right. Could that work. could be how you split the difference. Yeah. And there are plenty of different permutations where, like, with just various teams around the league that are in that kind of zone that could work for that kind of a. Thought. Yeah. And, and I'm just, I know that on, uh, what's it, July 1st this year. Um, we get Goudreau's no trade kicking in. He has no trade next year. So I can see New York teams being on his uh, tradable list. So that's why I thought that a New York team might make sense. Yeah, well, like you even take a team like uh, my second favorite team, the Florida Panthers, who are the, the best team in the NHL, if I recall correctly. Um, and like they have plenty of play right now. Uh, with their cap structure and everything, and they have a lot of good prospects. So, like, even a, a situation like Florida, where it's not, ne you know, like, what... necessarily what Gaudreau would want in terms of, like, proximity to home exactly, but it would be closer, certainly, and would, you know, like, Florida does have a lot of parts that would be just perfect for... Uh, what the Flames are trying to do either up front or on the blue line. So, Yeah, I mean, I was just using those guys as sort of an oh, example yeah. of an uh, older guy, not a uh, 35, 37-year-old, but a guy who is plugged in the lineup who can still contribute. Their best years might be behind them, but you know what kind of numbers you're going to get, and it would let a guy like a Dubé or Mangiapane yeah. or someone else develop along with that guy. Yeah, oh, for sure. You know, and, and that might be if we're trying to, get, you know, if we're not sure the way we want to go, maybe that's the best way to do it is split the difference, get a middle six forward from another team and a young piece to go along with it. Yeah, I could see that. Um, you know, another potential, if we do this in the off season, another potential trade partner I could see would be Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, I, Again, they well, got they, a they've whole... Been, they've been a huge infusion in the arm with getting Kaprizov, so... Um, yeah, and I can like, see them wanting to add a big piece like that. Yeah, exactly. And like, if you were willing to take uh, one of their two dreaded contracts back, like they'd have to eat a good portion of it. But you know, like that could work too. Yeah, there's there's lots of ways you could do that. And, and I think honestly, I don't think the Goudreau deal will happen until after the expansion draft because I think a lot of teams are not going to want to bring in big money until they know what they have or don't have true and i think there will be some trades happening around that draft so i think this will probably happen in the summer yeah um another i mean another place i could yeah we, we could talk potentials all day but i could all see columbus wanting to make a big splash in the summer and i could see the flames again taking on like a Folingo or an atkinson sort of that again middle six forward who's in their 30s and a top young piece yeah no, for sure. And there's plenty of permutations. Like, I think that the key here is 
cycling out the existing players uh, that are not performing and getting viable pieces, whether they're in the NHL like and partially or fully established, or going like full on prospect, one way or the other, like this team just needs an infusion of different frankly well and, and to me that's the big key is i don't think we need to necessarily say that it's time for a rebuild i think we just need different right now and there's certain key guys that we just need to move on from and bring in new ones and maybe for a year try putting our faith in different guys who are already here yeah um but let's talk we've talked a lot about goudreau but we're now you know a week out from the trade deadline by the time everyone hears this it's uh, on the 12th the Flames, I would say at this point, Matt, are we fair to say the Flames are either going to hold Pat or sell? They're not going to be buyers. Yeah, well, frankly, I think that any UFA to be that you can get any asset for will be gone. And let's look at that list. The list of UFAs the Flames have, David Riddick, Dominique Simon, Simon Nikita Nesterov, Michael Stone, Joachim Nordstrom, Josh Levo and Derek Ryan. To me, there's two guys in there that hold value, David Riddick and Derek Ryan. Nobody's given you, I mean, unless someone's trying to fill in like we did with Gustafsson and that sort of thing in the past, someone just needs a forward, Simone, Levo, Nordstrom maybe, but you're not going to make that deal over over you know the border. No one's going to want to wait two weeks for those guys. Yeah, like any of the like depth players, whether it's Nesterov, Stone, Nordstrom, Levo, or Simon, like at best you're going to get like a seventh round pick or a AHL level body. Well, and knowing how those often go with the deadline, it'll be some weird conditional of if they play half the playoff games and don't get COVID and their mom was born on a Tuesday that we'll get a seventh. If not, we get nothing. Yeah. Something along those lines. And you know, that it'll be like honestly with those i think it would just be clearing out roster spots for uh frankly like the young guys from stockton to come up but even then with with the taxi squad i don't even think you need to do that this year i mean you can just taxi squad some of those guys or exposing the waivers and someone wants them take them but i think with the taxi squad you can easily hide some of those guys away if you will and bring up some stockton bodies true it yeah, like it's and one I of mean, those... you're already paying them. Even if you want to officially send them down and eat the contract, you're already paying it. Yeah, it it's but... one of those where, like, I put it this way: the only two guys that I could, well, three guys that I could see getting traded from that list would be Nesterov, Stone, and Nordstrom. Uh, Nordstrom because of his physical presence, like he he is a banger. But and... I think everybody has one of those. No, I know, but like. Team, yeah, I wouldn't expect to get anything really for him. It would be like a seventh. And, and I think I, that if you're think, waiting to get, if you're waiting to get one of those guys, you're not going to want to wait a week to get them quarantined. So you're sending them to Canada, and I don't know which Canadian team wants you know those small pieces. Yeah, like it, it's one of those where you, know, you don't like, have thirty. You don't have thirty trade partners for those guys. You've got six trade partners. Yeah, and it's one of those where I think. You know, like teams might need a depth guy and, you know, a conditional draft pick or just future considerations, or we keep them. It, like, it, the level of concern is zero, basically, with any of those guys. Well, let's talk about the two guys that might be worth something. Let's start with the centerman, Derek Ryan. There's been some notions I've heard in hockey media that uh, Edmonton might be interested in Ryan. Right now, I'd say if you can move Ryan on an expiring deal for anything, take the deal. I mean, even if it's for a seventh move on from him. You can always bring him back, you know, July 1st if you really like him. But I think that, honestly, I would move him and move on from him. I think there's other guys that could replace him. And money-wise, I think the Flames would like to be out from that next year. Yeah. I think you could get a third, maybe a fourth. Like, you know, and I think, like, it would be viable. Like, uh, he, he what, is Where very... do you think he would go? Who can you see as being a buyer for him? Uh... Well, there's a bunch of teams. Basically, anybody who needs a good center, that a depth center, and like those guys always go for more than you would expect. So, uh, like, uh, yeah, I would expect a, a third from some team. Uh, um, Montreal could use them. Edmonton could certainly use any NHL player. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Edmonton could use an NHL body. 
Yeah, like, literally, there's, like, eight guys on the Flames that the Oilers could use just as, hey, we Maybe need we'll NHL bodies. Maybe we'll give them a big bodies. package. We'll give you Ryan and Levo and Simone and Nordstrom and Nesterov. You give us two picks and we'll call it a day. <laughs> yep. A second and a fourth and you can have this whole package. And, and you got to pay for the van rental to get them up there. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I think... I think Ryan will probably go for a mid-level pick. I can see it again being a, some sort of conditional if it's a fourth. Unless he plays so many playoff games, then it's a third. I could see something like that. That tends to be what that kind of guy goes for at the deadline. I think the real piece here that's going to be interesting is David Riddick. Yeah, and, you know, honestly, the one team that could really use him is the Edmonton Oilers, and the next best would be the Toronto Maple Leafs. And see, I was thinking, I was thinking the Leafs. Yeah. Well, frankly, like, the Oilers, like, Mike Smith, uh, he's old, and, you know, like, yeah. Like, Riddick has but, played but well. He's, at... But Riddick is also a rental, right? I mean, yes, Smith is old, but Smith has looked good this year. I don't think that you bring in Riddick True. and say, wow, we've solved our goalie issue. If you want to do that, do it, you know, I'm calling it July 1st, but whatever the off season is. I think if you're looking at a team that needs immediate help in the Canadian Toronto, division, it's yeah. Toronto. Yeah. I think Edmonton is comfortable enough riding Smith for the rest of the year. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, Toronto definitely does, though, need a goaltender. And, and I think if Toronto brings somebody in, Toronto has an extra body that I could see end up in Edmonton. Let's say, for example, Riddick goes Toronto. I could see Hutchinson going to Edmonton or something just because now there's this carousel. Yeah, exactly and but i think the most likely destination for riddick is toronto and i know that toronto said they don't want to bring on salary i mean it's not that much salary for a goalie he's a good contract for the rest of the year and again i think you could get some futures there whether that's a pick whether it's a prospect i don't think you bring in a roster player toronto doesn't want to part with any roster players that we would want but yeah. i think that's the the futures piece yeah that could be and i think that with uh riddick you're looking at a second or equivalent yeah, I could see a second. That could be where you get your defensive prospect you're talking about, too. Yeah. Yeah, like if you got Lilligren for, like, Riddick and something, that would be perfect. Yeah, and it might not be your top-end defensive prospect, but it might be your sort of B-level, you know, B with an A ceiling guy. Yeah. Um, You know, but I don't think that Riddick moves for a roster player. If Riddick does move, who, if you're the GM or the coach, do you call up to be the backup for the rest of the year? Uh, probably uh, Deming, just for yeah ease. Um, so if Riddick's gone, that means that we, I mean, we have no backup next year. Do you think that role gets filled internally, or do you think we would go shopping for a backup again? I well, I think that frankly, you're looking at. Uh, you're going to need, like, an Anton Hudobin type, like, just decent but unspectacular backup guy. And Because I'm wondering, if they think it's Zagadulin or Parsons, do you just bring those guys up and give them both, let's say, five games to see who looks better so you have some idea of if the solution is internal or if the solution's external? Yeah, and I think that's what you're going to have to see is... Especially like, with both guys being in Calgary because Stockton's playing here. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what I would do is I would move on from Riddick, get whatever pick or prospect you can, and then try try both those guys. Give them both, say, you know, a, a set of back. We got a lot of back-to-backs. I mean, we have a back-to-back against Ottawa. We have three three and four nights against Montreal. I'd sort of bring your, your farm guys in, play them each in one of those series, and then just put Dominion, for, you know, as the backup for the rest. Yeah. Like, I'm just, I'm just looking here. If that deal gets made on the 12th, let's say, and, and change the names out, but goalie A gets Toronto-Montreal-Montreal the next three games. Goalie B gets Ottawa-Ottawa. The winner of that series is the backup for, you know, Montreal-Montreal-Montreal. And you know that the guy's going to play at least one of them. You kind of make it so they're going to play one with Riddick playing the rest. And then you put in Mar- and then you put in Deming for Edmonton, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Vancouver. The last five games of the year. Yeah, uh, I could see something along those lines. And, like- and if Markstrom is hurt, let's shut him down. I mean, if we're out of the playoffs, let's go with a, you know, Deming Parsons or Deming Zagadulin pair and see what they can do. 
Yeah, like, there's not really a... I mean, it, if Marsham's hurt, why keep playing him? Shut him down, yeah. get his surgery going early or whatever he needs to do. It, this is a long-term asset. I don't want to ruin it any further. Yeah, like, there's no need to rush on anything, really. Like this... That's it. If we if we decide we're out, I'd say, you know, shut Marsham down and go Doming and whoever. Yep. Yeah. Well, even um, if you gave marks from a few of the games, like, yeah, I, say, five. I don't know. That, that's what I would do. Yeah, we'll see. But other than that, I mean, if, yeah. you know, and, and I've always been one who has always liked the idea that we never traded with Edmonton. And then we, we broke the streak. Yeah. And I remember the first time I heard we made a trade with Edmonton. I'm like, wow, it must be great. And we brought in, like, Steve Steos or something. Like, it was just this lame depth guy for depth guy deal. So, to me, that seal has been broken. If Edmonton wants Ryan... Give him Ryan, you know, trade him, move him wherever you can. I think that, again, if we're just trying to move guys out of here and change our core, I'd say move as many bodies as you can. And as you were saying, we got some good drafts coming up. Even if you're getting extra third and fourth round picks, it gives you a currency. You need to decide to to draft it or move it. And we've seen what we've seen what tree living can do with picks. Yeah, exactly. And like, that's why I defer to like our scouting system. And Treliving. Like, Treliving is not a bad G- GM. And, like, after the Flames put up that 107-point season, like, yeah, that, that series against Colorado was extremely disconcerting, but you can't just go, oh, well, you really sucked in that playoffs. We're just going to blow this team up now. You know, you had to wait and get more information, get more information, and, like, now with Sutter coming in, we've got all the information we need. And, yeah, that is basically the character of this team, and they are going to do that. So, cash in and, you know, uh, and cycle things out. And, you know, True Living's always been very adept at, okay, this is our main area of need. Let's go fix it. And, you know, like last season, the defense and the goaltending was suspect, most of all. And the main additions were Mark Sermontanov and bringing Valimaki in and, you know, like cycling out TJ Brody and a few others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, and admittedly the Flames defense and goaltending have actually been the best part of this team this season. Well, it's been the forward group. even Even if you can't make any moves to the deadline, just getting rid of $6 million in salary between Derek Ryan and, David Riddick in the offseason is just going to give you the ability to move. Like, you have money yeah. to do what you want to do with. Yeah, exactly. And, like, that's why, like, for me, um, ha- from this point forward, like, priority number one and priority number two, one is uh, training Mark Giordano uh, just because of the fact that of his age more than anything and – getting as much back from that asset as possible. And then number two is trading Johnny Gaudreau. A- after that, you know, like, if a proper trade came from Monaghan or Backland or, 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 mm-hmm. or, then you do it, but... No, we talked about the UFAs. There's one RFA that I think could be an even more valuable piece, and that's Sam Bennett. Sam Bennett, as we know, apparently asked for a trade earlier this year. I, again, don't want to move Bennett for the sake of moving Bennett, but I think he's got to be on that list you just gave us of guys to move out of here. I mean... Yeah, I agree. You know, and I, I can see Bennett moving to the deadline. Like, we talked about Derek Ryan of a team that wants a center. I think there's a lot of teams that would want a, a Bennett, and as a rental, plus you get his RFA rights. I think you trade for him and you qualify him immediately. I think that... Yeah. I think Bennett could be the guy that gets us that second pick. Yeah. And like Second round, honestly, I say. yeah, like I, I could see him getting like a um, Athanasiu level or close-ish level mm-hmm. return. Yeah, you know. and I think you could either you could go either way with Bennett, sort of like we were talking about earlier with Goudreau. You could either trade him for the pick or the future of the prospect, or you could trade him for a similar roster player who needs a change of scenery elsewhere. And, you know, yeah. you if you think you can sign him, or maybe there's another team who has a guy longer term who would want to do that deal, but that's a guy, he's an RFA, so we don't have to trade him. I mean, we could qualify him and then trade him in the offseason. 
But that's a guy that I think would be valuable at the trade deadline is Sam Bennett. Yeah, and like I think that, uh, frankly, uh, Toronto and Montreal would both want him very much to be a good third line player for either of them. And if and you're already making a deal with Toronto to send them Riddick, I mean, you could get a pretty good return if you're sending Riddick and Bennett to Toronto. Yeah, exactly. And you'd have to eat a little bit, but who cares well, at that point? And I don't even know if you would have to eat. I mean, they're both on expiring deals, so even if you eat... Yeah, well, I mean, like, eating oh. a expiring contract type of thing yeah but that, but we've got the to, money then i mean i'm okay taking yeah. i don't want to take on a long-term contract but you could no. you could take it and, and i think the way you would do that if you're going to do it instead of eating the deal you'd probably just eat half these guys deals like i don't think calgary would take a guy back i think you'd just pay half their salaries or something like that yeah i mean who's toronto got expiring zach hyman wayne simmons Galchenyuk, Spezza, and Thornton, they're all on good deals. Um, Bogosian, and then the only other guys, Frederick Anderson, and they're move, not moving. So, sure, I'll take any one of those if you want to give me an expiring contract. We'll take – well, uh, Hyman's on a modified no trade. Simmons on no trade. So, the only one they could really give us is Galchenyuk and a million. At that point, let's just eat a million. Mm-hmm. Or Bogosian. Sure, you want to give me Bogosian and a million? We'll take your like. I just they are not going to be able to move any of their expiring deals out of Toronto. Yeah. The only other, I guess, bad deal, depending on how you look at it, would be, um, yeah. Even then, you're not going to do that. I was going to say Kerfoot. I think is a little overpaid, but they're not going to want to move him. He's 26. So really, I mean, Toronto's going to have to find a way to eat it. And I think the best way to eat it is just to have Calgary absorb some of that. Yeah. Or I mean, the other thing you could do is depending on who you think your goalie of the future is, is you send Campbell back our way. And then now you have your backup for next year. Yeah. If they think if they be. think Anderson's their guy and they're willing to go shopping or then they can keep Riddick at a at a good contract, then maybe you send Campbell back this way and get rid of, yeah. you know, a million six from him. Yeah. So it just I think both those guys will be traded in the division. And I think this year's deadline is going to be mostly interdivisional trades, just because I can't see anyone wanting to wait a week or I can even see that number getting extended again with the recent outbreaks we're seeing in Canada of COVID. Um, I can see that going back to two weeks. I think they're both going to be moved within Canada. Yeah. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this week, our obituary on the season. But even though the flames are probably out of this, we've still got some hockey to talk about. We have essentially four games in the docket this week. I think they're only going to play two. I think the games in the 8th and the 10th against Vancouver will be canceled. So I think, Matt, if we look at this, we're probably predicting two games against Toronto today on Sunday as we record it, and another one Easter Monday. But let's predict all four just in case. And if we need to, we'll scale it back to last week. You and I were both optimistic. I thought we'd win two, lose one. You thought we'd win all three, and we ended up losing two and probably would have lost all three. Um, yeah. So today, as we're recording, Calgary's up two to one against Toronto. What's your prediction for the week? Uh, loss, loss. Okay. And, and what if we do end up playing the, the other two? A win and a loss. Okay. So you're assuming that if we're playing two, we lose them both. Yeah. <sighs> and you know, it might be good for the Flames to have a couple days here. I mean, if you're done by Monday. That gives Tree almost a week to figure out what he wants to do and even get players in or out of here because you're not going to need them for the rest of the week. So I can see if you are going to make a deal, make it early. Get your quarantining started for the guys getting out of here. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to go with loss, win, loss, win. I think that the Flames will lose tonight. I can see them winning tomorrow because just because Toronto's got some goaltending issues on a back-to-back, I think Hutchinson's going to probably end up being in. Um, and I think that the Flames have enough offense they can figure out how to beat Hutchinson. Um, and, and I mean, both teams will be tired. It's a back-to-back we usually don't see with both teams. But And then I, I think uh, Vancouver, if we play them, we can win the first one just because they've been sitting on the shelf for long enough. So I'm going to go loss, win, win, loss. I think that Vancouver will have been sitting on the shelf long enough that Calgary could beat them because of that, and then they'll lose on the 10th. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sandwich this week. Two losses on the outside and two wins on the inside. Uh. 
Well, Matt, that does, about does it for us. We will talk next week on the 11th on the the eve before trade deadline. We need to have a poem like the Christmas poem. Twas the night before trade deadline and all through the locker room. All the players were anxious to, I don't know, to find their new home. We'll come up with some rhyme for next week. Um, but it'll yeah. be it'll be the day before trade deadline that we talk next. Yeah. Will they find a garbage bag hanging in their locker room? <laughs> or Or will their bag no longer be there? Yeah. With hopes that what's our equipment well, manager's name? Like what wasn't uh, Robert Reichel when he got traded? Literally, all of his stuff was just literally thrown in a garbage bag. <laughs> or you probably heard the great uh, story of Craig Conroy where they just left him in Red Deer. Yeah. With hopes that a seat oh, yeah. on the bus still will be there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens there, but we'll be doing a show just before just before the deadline next week. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming that like we will have a lot of trade stuff to talk about. I think our business, especially if the Vancouver games get canceled, I think our business will pretty much be done by then. Yeah. All right. Well, Matt. Which I, I, well, I, well, I'm assuming it will be. Yeah, I, I think even if it's not, I think that you know we play on the 10th. I think that you could even see the deal done before the 10th and bring in your backup by then. I think either way it'll probably be done, but for sure if we're not playing and we get one, two, three, four, five, six, six days off, I think Tree's got nothing else to focus on but making moves. So we'll see what the new look Calgary Flames look like after that. Yep. All right. And, you know, and the thing is, is that, like, even when the Flames had down years in the past, like uh, in 1516, like, a lot of fans were like, oh, it, you know, it's really bad, and, the, you know, like, oh, we suck again, and all that. Well, at the end of the day, you got Matthew Kachuk out of the deal. So, like, you know, like, yeah, the, this season is a huge disappointment, and changes will have to be made, and significant ones. But, at the draft, the Flames are going to add a really good player, and they're going to get decent guys back, and, you know... Well, so I've Living's s- a good GM, and like, it, it won't be as bad. Like, it, we're not Edmonton, Buffalo, or Florida, where just the level of incompetence reigned. Like, this team does draft well. They have a GM who actually knows what issues there are. Well, I've said this on the show before. The Goudreau deal will not be a Jerome McGinley deal, right? You're going to get a guy yeah. that's equally as good, either now or in the future, for. Johnny Goudreau. Yeah, like you're not going to get some schlub. You're not getting Agostino and Hannafin or Hanowski was his name. Um, you know, you're either you're going to get a guy who's on the roster now or a guy who could be just as good two, three, four years down the road if you get those first. So I think that either way, I mean, you've got to give to get and we've got something to give up. We're going to be okay. Yeah. We're going to look different yeah. next year, but I think we'll be okay. You know, if we're without Bennett, if we're without Riddick, if we're without Goudreau, we're going to look very different. You know, I mean, we've got yeah. what, three other Fords are probably going to expire, one defenseman. So we're going to have some holes to fill. We're going to look very different. But I think that the assets are there to get us what we need back, whether that's yeah. futures and, or now. And plus, uh, plus, you're also going to have Daryl implementing the system right from the get-go, and the Flames are going to be playing the right way from the get-go. Well, and that's going to be part of who you bring in, right? Whether through trade or through free agency. It's who can play that system and who wants to play that system. Yeah, and, like, uh, you know, realistically, like, these players are going to realize that, you know, like, either shape up or ship out. And, you know, if you don't shape up, well, then that's fine, too. And and I think, honestly, uh, that's been part of it, right, is the threat's probably been there, but we've never actually done anything. We haven't really moved a core guy. And I think just doing that might, I don't want to say put the fear into people, but realize that we're finally serious. Yeah, and it's one of those, like, where, okay, you fire the coach, okay, you fire the coach, okay, you fire the coach. Now, Daryl's here. We can keep being lazy, and we're not going to pay for it. Someone else is going to pay for it. Yeah. And, you know, like, it at the end of the day, it's up to you to actually show up and play and earn the two points and, you know, be consistent. If you're going to throw games up like Winnipeg, you might as well just call up the Stockton Heat 
and you'll probably get a better result. Yeah. Well, and I think now if they're saying, you know, we're not getting rid of our coach. Daryl's here. These are the guys that didn't want to play. They're out. So who else wants to leave? Like, put your hand up and I'll move you if you don't want to be here, if you're true living. But I think that that's finally the, the thing is, you know, we've got our guy. we got our coach for better or for worse. He's the guy that we're standing behind. So you either come and play this way or you let us know and we'll find you a new home. Yeah, because realistically, Tre Living's very good at evaluating talent. And, you know, like Tanev and Markstrom have been good. Like, Markstrom, until he got hurt, was good. And, you know, like, usually when he makes a trade, like uh, the Hamilton trade, yeah, he gave up uh, Furland and Fox, and Fox has developed, but he wasn't going to stay here regardless. But Lindholm and Hannafin have... Well, Lindholm's the Flames' number one center, and uh, Hannafin's looking like a number one defenseman. So that was a good trade. And, like, it, as you look through everything, like, with the moves moving forward, things will be addressed, and they will be addressed well. It's just a matter of figuring out the parts and the pieces and the who's and the how's and all that. Yeah, and, and I think it'll be, like I said, I think come whatever July 1st is this year, come the 2nd or 5th of July, whatever you know our equivalent is, let's it might still be July, but um, I think this is going to be a very different-looking Flames team. Not better or worse, just different. Yeah, and, you know, like, it's one of those things that, like, you can have all the talent on paper. It, it's a results-based thing, like... If you're not actually putting the effort to improve yourself and improve how you're playing and, you know, trying to do the things that you need to do to win, then you're not really going to be useful at all. And, you know, like these players, like, yeah, they, they have all the talent in the world. They are one of the more talented teams in the NHL. They don't on paper. actually play on paper, but they don't actually play like it. And... You know, they literally play like a, a beer league team that is not wanting to be there. <laughs> the best description somebody gave me is it's like a team you put together on your Xbox when you're just hiring players. You don't have to worry about chemistry, right? It's like we just yeah. kind of brought in a whole bunch of guys that should look good, and it looks good on paper, it looks good on the TV screen, but you don't have to deal with those intangibles in those cases. Yeah, and... In this case, one of, I think, the main downfalls of this team is personalities and, you know, just buy-ins. And, you know, I don't, you know, there's certain players that just have never seemed to have it in them to commit to the level of things required to be, you know, an elite level player and in terms of conditioning or otherwise, and... I think everybody can figure out who I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, you're seeing, like, an attitude of, like, oh, I'm being criticized, how dare you, type of, you know, instead of, oh, I should do better. And, yeah. So, well, I think a lot of this will get cleared out, and you can actually get players that are, Yeah. Let's wait and see what happens the next week as we near the trade deadline, and we will uh, yeah. we'll talk after the deadline again and and see what's happened and if we're starting to see some of what you're mentioning. Yeah, and uh, as always, you know, like this team, it's just a march forward and responding to situations as they arise, and uh, you know you can only plan for what you expect and like if you have a guy who's a consistent 30 goal guy like monahan and he goes from that to like a 10 goal guy uh, you kind of can't expect that and plan ahead without it happening first and you know it, it and you can't expect like kachuk to be himself then a player is only meeting and then him turning invisible it's like, all it's you, all about how you bounce back next year, and I think right now we've just got to yeah. look ahead to next year and see what's still coming, and and you know maybe say you know what this year we didn't get the results we need. How do we make sure we get them for next year? Exactly, and in the long run, the only thing that matters is them 
changing the course and correcting things. And, you know, the, the talent will get there and, you know, the draft will happen and they will get somebody good. You know, I, I, I'm not concerned right now. The sky's now. not falling. This season might be over for us, but the sky's not falling by any stretch. No, and, like, I fully believe in the entire organizational system. Um, full confidence in the GM, coaching staff, everybody. It's This is literally a personnel issue. That'll get dealt with. You move on. You get new people. You figure out what their needs are. And you make corresponding moves after that. And then more corresponding moves and more and more and more. As, as the next like 12 months develop but that that's a tomorrow issue not a today issue slow and steady is going to win the race on this one matt watch take us out and we'll see how this week unfolds yep as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino fireside chat is licensed under creative commons license for full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.